Every drug, every therapy, every amazing advance in medicine started with one thing, an idea. But at the beginning, nobody knew what was the power of those ideas. And I'm here to share with you some stories about ideas and how they grow. So Rose, not her real name, um, was a, a little girl who was born with a birthmark on her cheek. And it was a small little uh, hemangioma that affects about 5% of children. And they usually grow for the first few months of life and then go away by the second year of life. So her parents weren't worried. Unfortunately, the hemangioma on Rose's cheek grew. It grew out, it grew in, and it grew up and it started threatening her eyesight on that side. And there's very few therapies that worked at that time. Um, High-dose steroids were tried, and they failed. And so this thing was growing, and it was starting to encroach on the eye socket. And of course, Rose's parents were uh, beyond their wit's end because the surgeon told them, if we cut into it, we can stimulate the growth. So surgery is not an option. Luckily, her plastic surgeon, Dr. Arneja, had read a paper where he'd seen that um, people had used this 50-year-old blood pressure drug called a beta blocker. And they'd used it on small hemangiomas in other parts of the body, and it had had a decent effect on them. So he wanted to try this uh, medication in Rose and five other children who either had these big hemangiomas threatening their eyesight or their airway, for which there was no other options for these kids. And this uh, is a picture of what uh, Rose and uh, another child looked like, and, and it's not her real name, of course. So he applied for a microgrant from the Rare Disease Foundation, which is the program I run, uh, to do this. And he wanted to do it in a safe way, so he wanted to develop a protocol. And we thought it was a great idea, so we gave him the money. And he treated these six children for six months with these uh, medications that cost pennies a pill. And the results were dramatic. The tumor went down, or the hemangioma went down, it, it resolved inside, and it was basically just a flat red lesion that needed some laser surgery for cosmetic reasons, but nothing else. And so this story really illustrates the power of an idea if you protect it at its earliest stages. Later on, another two doctors at our hospital, they were taking care of people with intellectual disability, what we used to call mental retardation. And they wanted to say, they wanted to look at what are all of the treatable causes of intellectual disability. And they wanted to do this systematically, so they applied for a microgrant, $3,500, same as before, to do this. And they, um, they wanted to hire a librarian to do this systematically to really search the whole world medical literature and find all the causes. And when this grant came through, I looked at it, I said, you know, doctors should really do their own research. I'm not really comfortable with hiring somebody to do your research. And the parents on our board um, said, you know, Millen, this is a good idea. And, um, you know, doctors are busy. We should, we should support them. And uh, I was like, okay, well, let's see how it goes. Well, we thought there were 20 or 25 of them, and I usually look for these in my practice. But what we found was that there was, what they found was that there were 76 of them. And then they developed a testing protocol to rule them all out with standard laboratory testing. And on the basis of that, they went from the $3,500 microgrant to a $2.2 million grant. And they built an app, they built a website, they did a study to show that they could do what they said they could do with this, and they changed practice around the world. So that no child with intellectual disability will ever or should ever be missed again. And so Dr. Stockler and Dr. von Karnabeek's work 
has, been, has had a dramatic impact on the 170 million people who have intellectual disability, 2.5% of our population. But almost every cause of intellectual disability is rare. And so what is a rare disease? There's many uh, definitions that are used in different places around the world. What, the one we use is any disease that affects one out of every 2,000 people or less in their lifetime is a rare disease or condition. And that doesn't sound like a lot, one in 2,000, but we have 8,000 different rare diseases. And when you add up all of those rare frequencies, it adds up to one out of every 12 people has a rare disease. So rare is everywhere. When I tell people that stat, they go, hmm, I don't think so. When I think of my friends, I, I don't think one out of 12 of my friends has a rare, rare disease, or one out of 12 of my family members. And the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is because if you are so sensitive to a single amino acid in protein that the amount of protein in a leaf of lettuce can throw you into a coma, so you actually have to weigh your lettuce before you eat it to make sure you get just the right amount, you won't know it. Those people are running around having fun. So rare diseases are invisible. And another big reason is because 25%, a quarter of children with a rare disease, don't live to see their fifth birthday. And that's a big reason why I'm in this, why I care. I want to change that statistic. I want to tell you another story about Chase, not his real name. He, he was a little boy who had uh, infections. He kept getting infections, his kidneys, his liver, his lungs, his... Uh, his bladder, ears, even meningitis, and he kept coming into hospital, getting filled up with antibiotics, would get better, and would go home. And then two, three weeks later, he'd get another infection, he'd be back into the hospital. And his care was totally reactive, just reacting, reacting to whatever was showing up. And sometimes he had a fever and they couldn't figure out what was going on, so just gave him antibiotics till he got better. So this was very hard on him, very hard on his family. And his doctor, Dr. Rasmus, said, you know what, I'm going to apply for a microgrant. This is back in the days before genome sequencing was readily available. And I want to sequence all of this boy's genes and see, are there any clues there that can convert our care from being reactive to being proactive, which is ideally how care takes place. Um, so we thought it was a great idea, gave him the grant, and he found that Chase had a problem in his white blood cells. And he confirmed it in the lab, and he knew that white blood cells come from the bone marrow. They offered, the team offered the parents a bone marrow transplant, and luckily there was a matched donor. Chase was transplanted, and he had no more infections. And so they said, well, let's do this for some other children like Chase. And so they applied for a grant, got several hundred thousand dollars, did it for a bunch of other children, and now they've built a program so that kids can be screened for this, and if they're severe enough, they can be offered a bone marrow transplant to cure them. So this illustrates how an idea where you start with one single child with one problem and then amplify up to a group of children, and then a whole group of disorders with curative therapy for them. And that amplification is not apparent at the beginning. You don't know. So what we've learned from our work in this program is, number one, that small is beautiful. We've shown you can fix a disease for $3,500, and we've done it many times. Right now in our system, it costs $2 billion, with a B, to make one drug. And what that means is there's a whole group of conditions where you can't get your money back. 
And as drug prices go up and up and up every year, that group of conditions that will never, ever, ever have drugs developed for them gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we've shown you can hack this system, and other groups have shown other ways. So I say, let's hack the system, let's reinvent the system, let's reinvigorate the system, and let's take our system back. The second thing we've learned is that some crowds are wise. And our rare disease community crowd is very wise. One disease flummoxed researchers for years could not figure out how does this disease work. And one day, grandma comes into clinic and she goes, you know, my grandson, and he's seven, and he's having repeated strokes. Extremely tragic to see a, a young child have strokes. And she said, you know, I've noticed my grandson only has a stroke when it's really hot out. And that blew the disease open. They tested it in mice, and sure enough, it was an abnormal heat shock protein response. And now that disease is in drug development to reverse that abnormal response. So looking for wisdom wherever it comes from is necessary for us to harvest all the great ideas that are out there. And it might come from you. And it might come from you. Finally, we've, what we've learned is that ideas are at their most vulnerable when they're first born. That's when they need protection. And we're at a stage in our world where we have a lot of tough problems. We're facing some intractable problems. And we need all of our ideas. And I say we need to protect them all. Because we don't know which ones are going to be the great ideas. So let's protect them all and give them a chance to run and give those great ideas a chance to emerge. And then let's make magic. Thank you. <laughs>